Yeah. But you are you are doing both. That's good. Good sign. Except Jackie, I think she didn't eat bitter gourd, right? <laughs> That's good. And thanks to Dr. Reddy who who provided some bitter gourd uh, pickles today, and also he helped me today. I was uh, somehow after the dinner I was sick yesterday night. I had a sore throat and I could not sleep at all. And then he he took he he gave me some Western medicine, not bitter gourd, and I'm I think I'm okay now. I took some antibiotics this morning, but again. What I'm going to do is, uh, I know you heard a lot about bitter gourd, and I'm hoping that when you go home, you'll start eating more bitter gourd sooner before you even continue research. That's important because we can we can tell people to eat because we did research because we got some funding funding came and we can maintain the job. That's why you are telling people. But you have to start eating first, then your neighbors or the family friends will eat. So that is important. I always question about this part. Uh, having said that, I didn't eat for the last three, four days. Of course, enough of what I usually eat. I eat normally at least nine, ten servings per day on an everyday basis. So with that, I'm going to kind of give you an overview of what I'm going to cover. Uh, what are the current statistics? And I'm very bad in, in diverting the topic. And if I told one of my friends to stop me at 45 minutes because I am very good in implementing rules, but I'm not a good follower of the rules. So. Uh, Questions to be asked: Can these chronic diseases can be prevented? What are the evidences? And whether these phytonutrients we talked about the last two days, are there any evidences based on the in vitro and in vivo studies linking food and agriculture? That was assigned for me to talk about it. And what are the components of farm to the field? And this is a good conference. We have people from breeding to post harvest to the nutrition and medicine. That's a good thing for the bitter gourd people. And what are the take home messages? So, if you look at the current statistics, about 75% of the disease is the four top 10 diseases: heart, uh, cancer, stroke, and diabetes. So, what is the common factor? Can anybody guess why we are getting those kind of problems still? We are not solving it. Change of food habit. Yeah, change of food habit, and that's another problem here. <laughs> so, we are all getting obese to some extent. India is not that bad. And I went to several countries in the last 20 years, and this is the problem. So, the obesity, as you heard from a lot of speakers in the last two days, is it causes the oxidative stress leads to obesity, and which leads to hypertension, which leads to type 2 diabetes, and also cancer. This is a paper published recently. This is a hypothetical model again, and a lot of speakers talked about this. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on what the other speakers told, but at least you see oxidative stress can be smoking or it could be your stressful sometimes. If your wife is upset on you or whatever the way, the spousal problems, or if you are really not happy, that stress also can lead to some of this, not just obesity only. So, if you look at how we came to this obese generation, now, back in 1940s or even before, people or girls, if they were skinny, boys would not see them. This is the story long back. And they said they could not date the skinny girls. Now in America, everybody wants to be skinny. So that's a challenge. So I think the, the perception of the people, how we treat, and smoking is the same thing in the US. The US started smoking and now there's only 19% 19% of the people in the US smokes. In India, it's about 80%. So we, we borrow a lot of this Western thing and now they stop. And among the graduate students in the US, only 5% of them are smokers. So that is an interesting thing. Education makes a big thing. So the skinny was one time a, a, a bad thing, but now again it's a fat, right? Just like smoking. One time when I was a student, I remember girls used to go to the people who used to smoke. I'm not saying that I was, I was looking for that situation, but that was a fad at that time 20 years ago when we were in college. So. So that's what we're here now. So if we're thinking about the economic impact on these diseases, is about almost the four diseases I mentioned earlier is about $762 billion in the US. When we look at the obesity in the last 30 years, you can see that in, in, in about 1985, it was only 10%. If you look at those uh, bar graphs, you can see that this is 10%. And as you move forward in 1988, you can see that Texas already got into 10 to 14 percent. Oh. Sorry. So again, you can see that, uh, watch for the darker blue color. So you can see that in 1989, it was again 10 to 14 percent in US. And in 1994, 15 to 19 percent population was obese. And 
in 99, you can see that again more than 20 percent, 35 percent in the last uh, 2012 data. This is in the US situation, of course. I'm supposed to be talking what is happening in here or in the global level, right? So if you look at the global trend, and I don't trust this data because I observed Indonesia and other countries, there are obese people. The percentage of people are obese also, but in this data, it shows only US is really getting obese. But in even in India, people are getting not just 10 percent if you look at that. Sorry. So if you look at the diabetes, we're talking about it is going to increase. And India and China are the major, uh, they have to face a lot of challenges in future. So 100 percent increase in uh, diabetes rate. So by 2030, there is an expectation that about 100 million people in India will be obese. Uh, I'm sorry, diabetic. So if you look at the amount of money they're spending, U.S. is spending uh, the total number of people in diabetes in U.S. is 24.4 million, and India is about 93 million now, 92 million. But if you look at the dollars, U.S. is spending more money on, on preventing this diabetes. 233 billion dollars. I hope they will give at least one billion for this bitter garden research to prevent obesity. And no, no country is doing that. And I think I heard Dr. Rao, he's getting some money, that's great actually. We want that kind of prevention aspect, putting money into prevention of diabetes. <clears throat> so, you heard that in the last three, four days, or two days, that India is of course getting really problem in diabetes and the Hyderabad is the second in the country. Trivandrum is the first one and Hyderabad is in second. I think Somebody was saying 16% yesterday, and he is right. This is, of course, data for two years ago. So the trend of diabetes in Hyderabad is definitely 16%. It was 14.1% at that time. So main reason is, again, coming back to food. You see that even in India, everybody's eating this. And particularly in Asia, if you look at that, see how, how why Asia has got into that. It's because, again, Western world is kind of adapting. Where the McDonald's were started in the U.S., right? All these fast food restaurants. Everything come from the Western world. So now we're addicted. In fact, eating pizza and going to McDonald's in, McDonald's in India is a fashion, right? So they go for a party time only. So that's how we got into this situation, obesity, and leading to all the other diseases. So now I'm going to pause you. Do you think we can prevent this? Anybody? Yes. Good. I see only one hand. You heard two days that we can prevent diseases, right? So you are not believing it. That's a good point. That's what I asked you. Why? Because still believe I'm going to tell that in a minute. We still need a lot of science. As you heard. So I wanted to hear at least 30% of the population here. Yes, we can prevent, right? So to look at that, yes, we can. We can prevent. 75% of the disease is preventable by certain source of vessels. Not that all of that can be prevented. I'm saying prevention, not cure. Because I'm an architecture major. If I say cure, I have to have an MD degree. Right? Like that Rao and others. So, what are the mechanisms? There are several mechanisms. I'm not going to talk about it. You heard some of the mechanisms for preventing diseases. There's a lot of literature available on, on some of these fruits and vegetables in general based on these mechanisms. Of course, these are just only five. There are about nine to eleven types of mechanisms of cancer prevention. So some of these phytochemicals in plant works in these mechanisms. So I tell my students all the time, if I take a bark of the outside, if I test in cell culture, it works. It prevents cancer cells. We did that for a, for a part. So all these plants have certain compounds. It kills cancer cells, of course. But the goal is, can we avoid <coughs> affecting the normal cells? That's what the plant helps. <coughs> all the drugs can kill cancer cells. Right? But at the same time, the drugs kill normal cells too. That's why when there's an imbalance, then we can activate the cancer. But what we're looking from the plants is how do we kill the cancer cells but not normal cells. That's the beauty of the plant compounds, right? and particularly bitter garden. So if I ask you a question, how many compounds do you think the plant kingdom can provide? Some of the secondary metabolites or phytochemicals or functional components or phytonutrients. How many do how many you think in bitter garden has? Can anybody guess? No, in, in general, yes. In all the fruits and vegetables, about 100,000. 200,000. Yeah, that's, that's good. That's any answer because nobody knows exactly. <laughs> because everybody has to. In bitter that, how many? Somebody was saying. How many numbers? I don't know exactly. So there are about 224. So if you ask me, do I know all of them? No. We're still looking for that. That's what this whole conference is, right? So I, I agree with uh, Kurt that we don't have to look for those compounds and 
find the benefits of that. At the end of the day, we want the growers to make money. The farmers should get money because they put in a lot of their effort in growing this. So if we take this compound and make a pill out of it and sell it as a drug, the whole carpet's purpose will not be served. So there are compounds, and again, there are a lot of ideal sources. So these are some of the compounds, the, the crops. Like we work, we work a lot on citrus. We isolated about uh, 57 limonoids. Limonoids are similar to neem tree. We tested in cancer cells. We tested in animal cells, in animal studies, and also we did the clinical trials, again, with a lot of collaboration. So, of course, I'm not really, I have not done any bitter guard work previously. We just started recently on bitter guard. But bitter guard is one of the compounds, as we talked in the last two days, has a lot of good terpenoids. Right? So, now the question is, I'm going to give you a case study. You heard about bitter guard a lot. And I'm going to show you whether you, when you go home today, whether you need to be eating fruits and vegetables or, or medicine or a pill from the fruits and vegetables. So I'll show you with an example, how many of you heard the carrot study, clinical, uh, clinical study? It's called, not carrot, C-A-R-R-E-E-T. Okay, if you didn't hear, but I'll try to explain what is the study now. So to get successful in making the consumers to eat any vegetable, not just bitter guard, we need to do all of this. You heard from Kurt and several people, they did a very good, eloquent way of explaining it. This is the way I call it as a road to success. So there are a lot of ancient knowledge, Right? So you have cell cultures, you have randomized control trials, you have meta-analysis. Meta-analysis, they compile thousands of studies of clinical data from the randomized control data. Then they select 8 to 10 based on certain criteria. If the meta-analysis proves that it is good for you, then we can convince the consumers. And then you can say it is successful. And so I hope in our lifetime we want to see that bitter guard will go to that stage. It is there now. I'm going to show you an example. So there are millions of studies done on cell culture and hundreds on randomized control data and very few are in meta-analysis to really take to the next stage. So if you like, take, how many of you take fruits and vegetables because it has bitter carotene? Bitter carotene, you believe in it, right? So I'm going to convince you before I end of this presentation to see what is your reaction. There are a lot of studies on, on, on cell culture. There are a lot of good evidences. Beta carotene is the best example we can use for a case, case study where it went through this whole road to success. In 1931, the beta carotene was named and it took about almost 200 years, about 170 years to understand. There are about 27,000 literature on antioxidants of beta, beta carotene in cell culture. Why still people are not eating fruits and vegetables is a question, right? So, again, there's a lot of history for that. They, they coined this as a good antioxidant. They also say that it helps in the reduction of the stroke. These are all, when we do some cell culture, the media comes out to the scientists and sometimes scientists get excited, we give a news article and that's what it is. It is a, it's back in 1984. It's a big thing about beta carotene. Every media was talking about it. So it reduces stroke in 90s and then 97 it, it says it prevents prostate cancer. So the, the important story, what I want to convey here is, as I said, this beta carotene went from the, the cell culture to the whole clinical data with the meta-analysis. We're not there on bitter card yet. We don't have any meta-analysis on that. So if you look at the, the 30, grams of, 30 milligrams of beta carotene they took, these are given to 18,000 people. Okay? So the conclusion was they found the increase in lung cancer. So, I don't want you to go home that, okay, this is all conference is not good for you. I want you to go home with some good message, of course. But this is just beta carotene pill. Just remember this. Okay? So the conclusion was they found increase in cancer. You can see those numbers, right? So the implication was these are workers. They were trying to, they said they stopped the study. They wanted to stop because the lung cancer was increasing those who are taking beta carotene for the control group. So then they stopped it. After that, they followed in 10 years later. They wanted to see how these same people who are stopping beta carotene, what happened. So, so you still see that there is an increase in lung cancer with this population. So the question was, they were giving to smokers. The smoking is not just small amount, 20 cigarettes per day. So what is the conclusion? Like somebody was asking, we have to give it to diabetic or not? Yes, if you are giving to the wrong people, sometimes these compounds may not work for you. 
if we're giving to the normal people, it may work. So the meta-analysis shows that beta carotene is increasing lung cancer. Of course, they stopped the study. So even the other study, this is again a meta-analysis study, ATBC studies, where you can see that beta carotene is there about 20 milligrams and alpha tocopherol. What you see here is beta carotene people are increasing the lung cancer. You see on the top. That is important. So if you look at compiling all these meta-analysis, and then they had a compilation of these studies, ATP study, carrot study, physician health, and these are the number of people taking this beta carotene. If you look at this, this number is no beta carotene, but these people have lung cancer. This number is increasing. This is with the one smokers group. And the current smokers the same number. I don't want you to remember all the numbers. Basically, the concept is when you gave the beta carotene with the smokers group, they increase. And physician health study, they didn't have a smoker. They were normal physicians. They were taking this beta carotene. Right? So, now what is the conclusion? We don't know whether fruits and vegetables are good, but at least it tells us the pill is not good. Right? Do you agree? Of course, you're still thinking, right? So, let me show you the benefits of fruits and vegetables as a whole. Like we're talking about extracts, like Dr. Kurt mentioned earlier. I'm not going to try to pronounce your last name, so I'm going to use Kurt for, for a while. <laughs> so, this is just for a people who are not aware of the human study. If the odds ratio is one or lesser, it's always good. Don't have to remember all the things. But these are the studies using the meta-analysis. You can see that less than one in most cases, higher intake of fruits and vegetables is in reducing the stroke. That's a good evidence in general. And I can, you can see that the three servings are five servings. Of course, somebody is eating three servings, that's good for reducing uh, stroke. So same thing with uh, another meta-analysis study on oral cancer. And what you see here is the reduction, the OR ratio is very low, right? It's less than one in all cases. So here what you see is NS is not significant. Even eating fruits and vegetables is not affecting. Of course, these are case control studies, not the human randomized blind control. But at least in case control and cohort studies, it is telling that in esophagus and breast and lung, eating vegetable is reducing the risk of uh, cancer. Uh, certain types of cancer fruits is the same thing. So that concludes. Of course, there's a lot of evidence now. Only thing I still don't have full evidence on cancer reduction by eating more fruits and vegetables. We need a lot of science here. But in terms of the heart disease, it's very clear based on the lot of meta-analysis studies now. So the take-home message, yes, somebody mentioned in the morning, lifestyle yoga is important. Yes, we want to prevent a lot of these diseases just by eating fruits and vegetables. Sometimes it's not good. We have to have the lifestyle. Lifestyle is very important to maintain the health. So now, what is the direction we have to change? Are we in the right direction? Are we confused? I think to some extent, yes, because I asked you how many of you ate 9 or 11 vegetables and fruits. Only one or, or nobody said yes, right? So we are probably confused because we don't have full evidence. Mom told you to eat fruits and vegetables, but she didn't tell you why. That's what the whole conference is. We need to provide the proof. We still have to provide the proof for the audience or the public. So, if you look at the average consumption in the last 20 years, US is putting a lot of money to increase fruits and vegetables. They are like you. Average is two servings per day. Total five servings is, is very hard to change. We need more consumption. Right now, on a global level, we are consuming 400 grams of fruits and vegetables. If we increase to 600 grams of fruits and vegetables, we can reduce, we can, re, uh, per person, we can save over $2,000 on health insurance. $2,000 is a big money for each person. So, even at homegrown vegetables, the consumption of fruits and vegetables is low. And in India, it is a bad situation. I come from a very rural background. I still go to the village. People who grow vegetables, unfortunately, they cannot eat because of the economy. They sell it. So, this is the trend. Wherein, how we can prevent diseases. So, Road to success, it is too complicated, right? So what I think, what we do in Texas A&M, in our center, we try to use the integrated approach. And I, still, I, I heard some of the people, okay, I'm here for a reading, but I, I hear only some talk. So what we need to do is, all the scientists here, this is a good conference, uh, I appreciate this, bringing the medical and nutrition and breeders together. That's what we've been doing in Texas A&M for the last 20 years. First in the United States, we started a center, it's called Vestival and Fruit Improvement Center on Foods for Health. So what we take is, we take all the approach from farm to the consumer, almost. So we do all the things, of course, in collaboration with a lot of scientists, of course, and you need money for all of this. So we call it as a farm to consumer. And unfortunately, 
in future, and even not future, it's right now, farm to consumer is not going to work. It's going to be reversed. Consumer will dictate. The table you eat is dictating what you have to grow. It's going to happen in future. And as I said, it is happening already. So the consumer will start telling, okay, what do I need from this fruit or vegetable? So, role of bitter guard. I'm, what I'm going to do is, because of the bitter guard thing, I'm going to skip a lot of slides because you heard a lot. I'm going to come back to some important things. But I'm going to still use some of the examples and which are, I tried to delete a lot of slides because I saw a lot of presenters use some of the slides already. So I'm, I'm going to skip some of those. Uh, but right now what you're going to see is not anything repeated in the last two days. So, bitter gourd is a gourd's food, it's considered. And extract of bitter melon has shown some breast cancer work in, uh, in Colorado University. Again, this is a cell culture. That's what I was telling you. Sometimes the scientists do a cell culture, it goes to the BBC. I wish every story from what Kurt and uh, Mike is doing and some of the Indian uh, friends are doing should go to those new stories, not the cell culture in my opinion. Although we do a lot of cell culture, okay? So, in, 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 uh, in, uh, in other countries it is also called bitter melon, it's a super vegetable. In my opinion, I don't want to find any vegetable or a fruit as a super. I was, asked, I was asked to give a talk one time, can you make a presentation on citrus is super because we have about 100, 100 120 papers on citrus alone. But I said I'm not going to claim it until it passes that meta-analysis meta study. So even this can be called as a super vegetable until we really need, we have to reach to that goal. So again, you see that lot of articles on, on, on uh, sweetness uh, for diabetes, sweet results for diabetes. There are a lot of products of bitter guard. But what is also important is proof of concept. So as I said, and you heard a lot of studies earlier from the antioxidant to in vivo study and clinical trial. So we are there. Bitter guard has some studies. So if you look at the triangle I showed you earlier, it has 100 evidence is from the historical perspective, there are 15 in molecular mechanism study. Again, these numbers are not the perfect way, but that's what is available in the literature. There are about 21 clinical data. What we're still missing is meta-analysis. So very few, of course, that's why we still, of course, for that we need dollars, right? Uh, we wish somebody from uh, in, investors like what Kurt was saying, invest money on this so that we can do more research on that. So are we in the right path? Yes, we are, I think, with regard researchers around the world and particularly in Asian countries are doing right way, including Germany. So there are some evidences that, for example, there are 14 compounds purified and the two compounds showed glucose uptake higher than insulin. I'm not going to spend a lot of time. You heard these words almost two days continuously. And again, this is an interesting study in cell culture with uh, one of the compound from bitter guard showed better than green tea. I know everybody started drinking green tea, right? So epiketachins. For example, in this case, epoxy curcubitin, one of the compound, has shown decrease in the anti-inflammatory activity and they gave the TNF-alpha. TNF-alpha is a pro-inflammatory. When they gave that and they were trying to reduce the inflammatory activity by, by the bitter guard extract. Compared to the green tea on the other side, you can see that it didn't help much. The green tea is popular yet. So there again, the extract, there are two compounds showed you can see that the, the insulin secretion is increased in, in all the compounds and the extract. And again, as I said, I'm not going to spend a lot of time. And this is again another example. I think Sarah, Sandra did some work on this. She showed already. High fat with the bitter melon extract. You can see that when you gave the bitter melon extract, you can see that the glucose, plasma glucose is reduced significantly. This is again animal study. And again, you can see that fasting glucose is significantly reduced and it's almost same as the drug. And you saw that already some of the results, right? You can see that uh, bitter on treatment and the one of the drug. And again, accumulation of lipids, you can see that. So what I want to stress here is, in, uh, and I think Sandra presented uh, 2013 data and there is another paper came in 2014. These are clinical data. What is the challenging part? And I, I, I wish... Uh, we could get more information and I think that maybe when, when I have a conference on Bitter Guard next time, hopefully all the researchers they presented two days ago will be published so that can fit to this, this date score. What I'm challenging all of you who are working on Bitter Guard is, it, these are all clinical data on Bitter Guard. What you find is only two studies are in A and B category, date score. That's what the reviewer wrote it. So interestingly, all the studies, that, that, that's what I was asking again, Mr. Ra, Dr. Rao earlier, 
these do not have any impact factor, they rejected those. So the only two studies are under their radar at least. So the rest of them they rated as C, which is kind of a C grade. So I'm not a human clinical that uh, person, I'm not going to really comment on whether this is good or not, but we need to see some of these impact factors. Again, as Kurt said, the impact factor is not the only criteria we have to use, but we need to make sure that the clinical data is done in the right way, so can be considered as part of the meta-analysis. That's my goal. Good. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to very quickly skip all the things I had planned. I, I got already the signal. So what I want to say is in our center, we started bitter melon work. It's one of my PhD students working on it. His goal is, again, his parents have uh, diabetes. He wanted to prevent that by growing in Texas. We never grown bitter gourd in Texas. We, we had like five varieties. So he tested DPPH activity. He tested the amylase activity. You can see the extracts are doing great. And uh, so the chloroform extract and acetone extract is doing great, great again here. And what we do is proof of the concept. We isolate different things. Again, this is an example of the citrus. We isolate compounds using different chemical methods. These are compounds isolated from bitter gourd. And these are compounds, total about 53 publication isolation of these bitter gourd compounds. We are speeding the process of isolation of some of the bitter gourd compounds by using flash chromatography now. We can save a lot of time, otherwise we have to go through the open column. So this is again a flash, I'm not going to really spend a lot of time in explaining it. These are compounds we isolated from bitter gourd. Charentin, which is already isolated, this is the other one. And I wanted to say, again, I will be skipping the slides, farm to post-harvest is important and farm to plate, I call. So that is very important in future to address some of these issues. And again, when you see that mature stage, vitamin C is reduced, varietal differences are there, you heard already from the two days ago. So there are some effects on roasting. Roasting has increased the antioxidant, I'm sorry, antioxidant capacity in bitter gourd. Oh, sorry. And again, taste is another thing. They tried to have some compound to mask the effect of this uh, bitter taste, which is not a good idea in my opinion. But they tested different products and they found, and again, it's not really changing the compound level. It's masking the effect. And again, the approach is formed to the plate. What I need to stress here is we still need to do a lot of these things. Varietal difference. We need to understand agriculture practices, increase public awareness. And this is an important part in bitter gourd particularly. Unless you convince the Jackie uh, to eat bitter gourd and others, I'm not just pointing out Jackie only, but that's the challenge for all the scientists. Can you breed a vegetable which is still some good compounds and make it tasty? That's what we did in Texas on onions. Because American consumers do not like the pungent onions. We developed a mild onion. It is almost a $1 billion industry now because of that. So that's the challenge we need to address. So. Again, there are a lot of products. And the other challenge I want to address is microbiota. And I, I, we kind of discussed just a few days ago, microbiota, we can all talk about this whole compounds, it will have an effect on diabetes, but if the microbiota doesn't permit us, some of the microbiota is sitting in us, it's changing everything, what we're eating, that's a challenge. So an example is a Chinese guy who ate bitter gourd and a yam, for a, and he reduced about 20, 20 kilograms, about 42 pounds in two years. That's an example of him by eating bitter gourd. So proof of concept, you can see a lot of publications there and it's increasing. That's a good sign. The proof of concept is coming on bitter gourd. But just to give an example of the curcumin, some of you heard, it's another case study. They spent a lot of time and you see the molecular mechanisms. These are the new theories on curcumin, which is part of the spicy food. And also there are a lot of molecular mechanisms they established. So I'm going to stop here and education is important. I'm going to, again, this is our approach in, in the center there. We approach all of these things, and this is an important thing. We need to communicate. We all do communicate in, in Texas and and all. If we don't, if we don't communicate each other, we're not going to progress on this research. So we all try to do pulling each other sometimes. That's not going to help. So this is another thing I wanted to stress. What we do in our center, we basically use the breeders, plant breeders. We, we go on to almost consumer preference. The data is fed to the nutrition scientists sensory evaluation. So we come back and breed a vegetable or fruit. We address all of those things in, in our center. So this is the approach we have to take into bitter gourd. And I think this funding you got from the ministry is already doing that part, in my opinion. It's, to some extent, it's already there. We are bringing in people together. 
So we have these many scientists in our center. Again, they are all from different uh, backgrounds, from medical science to nutritionists to plant breeders to plant physiologists. We all work in a team. And these are the companies we have in our center. There are about 26 companies, from seed companies to processing companies to the grocery chains, those who, who sell the vegetables. So that's the approach we are taking. And these are our advisory members from the medical science we, when we take a decision. So we just celebrated 20th anniversary for center last month. And these are the people we had a same dialogue there, how to increase consumption and what is the research needed. Yes, I'm going to stop there. Uh, if there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Well, thank you, Dr. Patil. I'd like to ask uh, to postpone the general discussion about your uh, presentation because it mm -hmm. fits very well into the general discussion. But immediate questions uh, regarding understanding of various aspects of uh, your presentation, uh, it's possible to ask questions by now. Has anybody a uh, question regarding understanding? Can you believe this presentation? If you don't mind. One or two or three of the single items Dr. Party mentioned. I don't see immediate questions. Okay. Thank you very much again for yeah, the presentation. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And please stay with us for the discussion. Yeah. Thank you.